topic uh, this afternoon is the bubble economy of microcredit experience in Thailand and what it tells us about solidarity. This lecture. He, when he answered my call lecturers in this series, he responded that the sooner that uh, he was the only one who said, I want to do it in September. Guatemala has been the subject of his research for many years. Topic of his doctoral dissertation that he prepared uh, at over time, the focus of his research has shifted from religion and efforts to human rights and on to. He's the author of five books and numerous articles. Sociology, Anthropology Department, Middlebury College. So please welcome David Stahl. Uh, could you help me get rid of that? Thank you. I'm 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 completely guilty. Scheduled for a beautiful day. Normally, I'd I'd uh, you know been willing to wait until November 10th, but we're all showing up here. Um, most of the team there are 20 years old. Uh, the girls, a good number of the people in the photos are dead. Um, these are these are but these are the people I've been working with. I probably should have left after the first decade. Why I've never succeeded in in staying away for very. Um, one of the reasons for those smiles you see in a lot of those photos. We're very glad to be alive. Uh, when I was in Nebak for the first time in 1982, quiet, scared town occupied by the. Uh, the army was chasing Marxist guerrillas uh, in the surrounding mountains, and um, both sides left. Now, um, at one point, much of the Ashil population, those are Ashil Mayas, uh, um, much of the Ashil population seemed to uh, support the guerrilla army of the poor, uh, which is why the, all the villages. Uh, that's the reason why you see some people in refugee situations. That's what they were living in for years. In the end, uh, at, the, at minimum, uh, either in massacres or from starvation up in the, uh, the army. Uh, many of the survivors were, were they joined born-again Protestant churches. And, and yet, uh, 25 years later, uh, it be completely recovered. Uh, the, the guerrillas demobilized the uh, the army's down to a platoon. In the most bustling town <clears throat> in this center in this part of Guatemala, uh, thanks to many aid projects, uh, have uh, replaced all the domestic livestock they lost in the fire. Uh, they're growing and selling a wider repertoire than before. Uh, you can hear big shuttle boom textiles all over town. Uh, it's taken over. Teaching profession, thousands of Ashil youth are going to history. Uh, the streets are filled with pickup, with careening three-wheeled taxis. Teenagers, like the women that you saw in in those shots, clump by wearing, uh, high heels and they're gabbing on cell phones. From the European Union showed up for the first time. The three and four-story houses going up, and his reaction was. Drug trade. Well, it's not the result of the result of aid projects um, in an aid bonanza that began 25 years ago and shows no sign of ending. For the endless parade of projects, is that most of the was displaced by the war. Uh, that's true. But devastated, and they never received the avalanche of aid. That Nebak. What makes Nebak such a mecca? Well, it's located in a beautiful mountain valley. 
Well, Mayas are a very handsome people to indigenous populations who react to outsiders with a lot of suspicion. Many shields are, are welcoming, or at least manage to put on a, a and uh, visitors are typically smitten. As we see the town in a dramatic valley below. I feel like we're entering Shangri-La. Um, uh, shields have become calendar Mayas in two very their diviners still use the Mayan calendar, the conservative wing of the Mayan spectrum. Their daykeepers still are observing the calendar that the classic Mayas used. Uh, and that traditional female dress that you saw uh, gets them into the picture put out by aid organizations. Guatemala has received as many aid projects as this town. It's by hundreds of aid consultants. It has benefited from in the international development community, sustainable agriculture and national exports, cooperatives to help people market their costs. There's a veterinary association, there are village pharmacies, medical center with free legal aid and mediators and sociologists to resuscitate traditional community law. There are food supplements and education for mothers and small children. There are medical charge from the United States and Cuba. Twenty years if you've heard about a kind of aid project, it's to be found headquartered within a five-minute walk of the, the plaza in Lebac. And yet, how many times have heard young, underemployed Ashil men complain, organization aquí que realmente nos da apoyo, organization here that gives us the help that we need. Many organizations have shown up. I doubt that there's any new organization these young men what they want. And so I want to look at Nibak as an economy, as a system of perceived needs, attempts to meet those needs through production and exchange. What has changed dramatically over the last 50 years? Because many of us would uh, like to believe that they're guardians of, the earth, of ancient wisdom, faithful defenders of their culture. Now, you can't find the shields who fit this description, but it may take you a little longer than you about their culture, many Ashils feel the way we feel about the 1950s. Sometimes we feel nostalgic about the 1950s. Sometimes we do not. Getting, getting yourself with alcohol to honor the saints. You saw a few shots of that. Uh, subsisting on diets of corn and beans. Surviving on incomes of a few dollars a day. Ashils have many good reasons to reject their traditional way of life. They are proud of who they're proud of where they come from, but they're also eager for the bright side of modernity, the creature comforts that they see on television and that they can attain by abandoning uh, many of their traditions. Community, falling in love with Nebak meant taking on a very open mission. Before the war, most of Shields were engaged in subsistence, uh, below subsistence farming, uh, in which they made up for their lack of land and their inability to produce enough food to feed themselves by migrating to coastal plantations for several months a year. The majority of Ashil children did not attend school, and most Ashils lived and died without medical care. When the army burned down their homes in the early 1980s, it ended their self-sufficiency. The majority of Ashils became Muslims. They learned to stand in line for rations, and they also learned that institution, a term that includes government agencies, uh, international agencies, and non-governmental organizations or NGOs, they learned that could be petitioned for a wide array of needs. And so capability, what project do you bring, became an acceptable opener uh, with foreigners like myself. But those aid agencies, they could hardly confine themselves to, to restoring the status quo. Before the war, the majority of the shields lived without running water. So all these and many more necessities of modern life would have to be provided for the first time in history. Moreover, because the shield women still six children, and these children begin reproducing in adolescence, Shields are starting hundreds of new households. So every year, some kind of aid agencies and governments is being asked to finance housing, electricity, potable water, roads, school, and health care for the equivalent of seven over the landscape. Now then, you might ask, isn't it all a foreign aid to help people develop new sources of income so they can become sufficient? That's right. 
which is why dozens of projects in Bach have tackled this project, this problem. There have been modest gains. Um, there, there are two associates that help hundreds of family families uh, sell their coffee at higher prices. That's worked well. There are families in certain favorable microclimates who are producing new export crops, such as French beans. Most of Shields do not have the right kind of land for uh, attractive uh, agricultural strategies. Um, even if the area's remaining plantations and large land holdings were, were like many already have, um, small cultivators have land to be self-sufficient. According to a study by agronomists, a shield country is too steep and has too little soil to ever provide the agricultural income needed to motor the area's development. Well, what about factories? Uh, this is actually possible now that the contractors have paved a wonderful new road into the shield country. But Guatemalan uh, factories have been closing because of low competition from China. As for retail and transport, occupations are already saturated with too many people offering the purpose. And so, Nibok's most important product, its principal industry, continues to be the production and export of surplus labor. Now, in the 1990s, there were two new ways to make a shield self-sufficient, the interactions between which will of my talk. The first idea was conceived by eight consultants, and it was to make it easier for a shields to borrow money so that entrepreneurs. You've all heard about the wonders of microcredit. Capitalism is supposed to lift the third world out of poverty uh, rather than In the case of the Ashils, uh, while the majority of them are trapped in below subsistence corn farming, many do have a trade on the side. Many have entrepreneurial ambitions. Before the Spanish conquest, the had a far, far ranging commercial civilization. Colonial rule, they conducted their own far flung trading networks. And in the 20th century, there are actually a few Mayas who have become well indigenous capitalists. So there's certainly a lot of there's a lot of motivation there to business or commercio, as they say. And so lending money to a good idea. It seemed like such a good idea that currently you can borrow from at least 17 different banks, credit institutions, and revolving loan funds located within a few minutes' walk in the town plaza. Most of these operations are new. As of uh, early 2008. The two largest have lent out 100 million quetzals. Throw in the smaller program, programs, and I would say that the total rises to the neighborhood of 2 million quetzals. And then if you throw in the many loans that Ashils and partners have extended to each other, I'm guessing this is back of the envelope calculation, 300 million uh, quetzals of debt. Uh, divide that figure by Ashil country's total population of 100,000 people, you get a debt load of only uh, 2,000 quetzals per person or 10,000 quetzals per five-person household. It's something like a year's income for that household. It does not sound so bad. Uh, but it turns out that this debt load is not distributed equally throughout a shield country. Instead, it falls predominantly on the shields of Nebak, far more than on the shields of Quetzal and Chihul. I think that the average debt load on uh, Nebahenses is a lot higher. Uh, but anyway, that's the first way to make a shield uh, self-sufficient lender. The second way to make a shield self-sufficient um, was considered by shields rather than by aid consultants, and it was to seek a more advantageous market in which to sell their labor. The shields have a lot of experience with selling their labor on disadvantageous terms. When a family runs out of corn several months before the next harvest, uh, the entire family goes to a coffee plantation so much for the pay, which is basically ridiculous, but for the food rations. Everybody gets fed while they're on the plantation. If you want to earn money faster, up to 10 or 12 a day, that's about top dollar for an Ashil peasant. The men go to sugar plantations for the brutal job of cutting. Not all of them can succeed at, at doing that. The work is too tough for many years. but if you're a young, vigorous uh, a male or a really tough old nut. Uh, you can earn up to twelve dollars a day shipping out. Probably that would require tons of sugar cane in one day. city? Uh, well, thousands of Ashils have tried working in factories, standing on corners selling stuff, but the living expenses are so high uh, that most return without any savings. Which leaves the United States. 
about which the Shields have been asking me ever since I got there. My ideas occurred to many other Guatemalans. According to the U.S. projection, there are 850,000 Guatemalans in the U.S. who are here legally. According to the International Organization for Migration, there are 1.6 million Guatemalans in the U.S., a third of whom are here legally. That would be close to one in every eight Guatemalans, if the IOM is right about that. In 2007, those Guatemalans in the U.S. sent back $4.1 dollars, which is the country's largest source of foreign exchange and almost equal to Guatemala's total exports of everything else. According to I, 900,000 Guatemalan households and almost 4 million Guatemalans, a third of the country, are receiving remittances from the United States. Now, in Guatemala, there are two institutions that handle most of the flow. In 2007, they transmitted 115 million quetzals from the United States. From the number of remittances they handle, which was 2,653 in April, I estimate very sending population of about 1,500 people in the United States, which I would increase by 50% to include migrants who are not sending remittances for a total of perhaps 2,200, 2,300 uh, ischials uh, in the U.S. Really, that's anthropological statistics. Uh, with only a few exceptions, uh, the the U.S. illegally, usually after paying $5,000 to uh, human smugglers or traffickers, except a handful of pioneers in the 1990s and maybe a few hundred others in 2001, uh, most of these people have uh, come here since 2002. They're to be found everywhere from Los Angeles to Syracuse, but they cluster in three localities because their lack of English makes them dependent on friends and relatives to find work. The three localities are Home, which is a plant nursery suburb of Greater Miami, Centerville, which is a Virginia suburb of Washington, D.C., and Dover, New Philadelphia, which is a small city near Africa. In Homestead and in Centerville, Shields work mainly for first generation immigrants who have obtained U.S. citizenship but do not obey U.S. labor laws. Uh, if uh, they're lucky. Uh, Ashils work 12 hours a day, a week, without any kind of overtime pay. And if Ashils are not lucky, they don't have a job at all. Instead, they stand beside the road, hoping that someone will drive by and offer them a day of work. Uh, in Philadelphia, in Ohio, Ashils work for Case Farms, which is a union busting meat packing company. And they also work for other unionized factories. Uh, back in Nebak, <clears throat> eight men who have returned from the U.S. men of means. There's more than eight, uh, but I have talked to eight guys who went to the U.S., were very successful, and have come back. Um, they left earlier than most of Shields in the 1990s, by 2002. The majority of the eight found well paid work in construction or on an crew for an Anglo boss who spoke very little Spanish, but who was so impressed by their work that uh, he paid them well and promoted them. Uh, the success of these men is very impressive to Ashields because they've been able to open well-stocked stores, hand some new houses, or start uh, well-financed uh, new business. So impressive that uh, now several thousand more Ashields have grown. Uh, mainly uh, young men between the ages of uh, 30. Ever since those several thousand left, the spouses and parents and siblings waiting for the remittances to pour back, and they've been disappointed. Why isn't my husband asked? This is the invariable question to me. Or why is he sending $100 a month, which is not enough even to pay which I sent him up there? It turns out that while sneaking into the U.S. is an obvious way to obtain a higher price for your labor, there are enormous risks that could easily leave you poorer. Ashields have to find work, three major financial obligations. They have to pay off the $5,000 being smuggled into the U.S. They may have to pay up to $1,000 a month for their living expenses here, and only then can they start sending back the large amounts that their relatives expect. 
Unfortunately, finding the employment to pay those three obligations means competing with other Ishields, Guatemalans, and Mexicans who've arrived in the same labor market with the same idea. Scenario is to be arrested and deported after five thousand dollars to get to the U.S., but be could pay off the debt. Once back in Guatemala, you deported back to Guatemala. There is no legitimate occupation that will pay that kind of debt. The only way to pay that kind of debt is to sell land if you still have any left to sell. Or the second five thousand dollars to try the United States again, doubling the debt that you have to pay to start breaking even. Uh, now, uh, for an obvious question. Where do a shields borrow the equivalent of three years' income to buy their way into the U.S.? Now, if they already have a relative here with a steady job, he can pay the debt pretty quickly. There are very fortunate issues in this position, but that's not the majority. The majority do not have relatives here with a steady job. Now, if a shields have a bit of land, they can sell it at the risk of never getting it back in any form, which leaves two other possibilities. You can borrow money from a local coyote or smuggler, keeping in mind that in Nebac, the Mexican origin term coyote refers to recruiters and moneylenders, not refer to the actual smugglers who take a shields across borders. Thus, the term coyote, while evoking the image of a wily individual who knows how to, to frustrate the U.S. Border Patrol, in this context, always refers to a network of whom are Ashields, some of whom are from Huehuetenango, some of whom are in Mexico, some of whom are investing the money made from migrants in loans to new migrants. Um, money from this source, in the dock, uh, the money lenders typically charge 10% interest a month, which means the debt is going to double in less than a year and it's going to triple in less than two years. Another place to borrow $5,000, guess what? 17-odd banks, credit associations, and revolving loan funds. The purpose of these institutions is emphatically not to finance illegal migration. If anything, microcredit is supposed to help Guatemalans stay at home and earn their living loan. No NIBAC institution will accept a loan application for the U.S., but until recently, most did not use their loans to smuggling networks as a serious problem. Institutions even view remittances as evidence of the ability to make a large loan that the borrower could never ever pay from Guatemalan income alone. So, that knowingly or unknowingly, for the most part knowingly, uh, institutions have taken on a very large investment in the American dream. This means importing into the sheets a tangle of complications that I am calling wives and mothers problem. Now, to tell the truth, wives and mothers do include some fathers and uncles, but there's a tendency for them to be female. The wives and mothers, or uncles and fathers, are the people who borrowed money to send their young man. They remain behind with the debt. If the man fails, they pay a large share of the consequences. Once in debt, $5,000 for a trip north, Ten or fifteen thousand dollars for the trip north. Fits of optimism have often sent two or three siblings at the same time to keep each other company. The people become too accustomed to great uncertainty over the future. Their future hinges on whether remittances, are as well as on cell phone calls, which are very cheap and very dangerous, because the instant transmission of bad news. Thus, the proverbial phone call from a who has gotten drunk because he lost his job, he lost his job because he got drunk, uses his wife of infidelity. When many families wonder whether their man has relapsed into a new household with another woman, I have no way of trying, but everyone in Nebach agrees that illegal migration is hard on marriages. According to the National Office of Migration, which uh, did a survey of the families of Central American uh, migrants, I'm not sure where or how, the IOM, 36 of these marriages, 36 percent disintegrate after uh, the, the husband goes up to the States. 
It turns out that migration is also very hard on revolving loan funds. When wives and mothers lose a wage earner to El Norte, some have tried to compensate by borrowing money from credit institutions at 1% or 2% interest a month in order to loan it out to neighbors at 8% a month. They want to live off the difference. Um, in my two visits in October of last year and uh, April of this year, courtesy of the Faculty De Professional Development Fund and the Mellon Foundation and the Ada Kent Howe Foundation, uh, I met a total of 24 coyotes in Nebak. Since my sample is a snowball sample through personal contacts, it's not necessarily representative. Two-thirds of these individuals were men, ranging from very professional recruiters to fast-talking brokers who financed us a month. Eight of the 24 coyotes were women. Of the four women who had husbands, three of the husbands were in the U.S. Of the four women who did not have They'd lost their man to some combination of migration, alcohol, and Five of these eight have been borrowing money from institutions at a low in order to lend it to migrants at a much higher rate of interest. Of these five, three have been ruined by deadbeats from whom they obtain no collateral or collateral that isn't worth much. Three female moneylenders have been keeping their head above water only by taking out more loans, that is, by robbing Peter to pay Paul. Now, why would institutions lend more money under these precarious circumstances? Don't they demand collateral? For larger loans, institutions do demand collateral. The integrity of the titles is dicey because in this kind of context, they're very easy to duplicate uh, with the help of a notary or a lawyer. Hence, the Ashiel practice of borrowing multiple times on the same piece of property. For smaller loans, Nebat credit institutions have not asked for collateral, especially when working with women. Uh, instead of collateral, institutions have relied on what they call the principle of solidarity. According to this principle of the microcredit industry, borrowers who lack collateral join so-called solidarity groups. No one in the group will be able to obtain a second loan until everybody in the group has repaid the first loan. And so, quote, solidarity, i.e. social pressure, is supposed to produce a high level of repayment. That's the theory. In practice, a shield borrowers who can't repay loans have learned to jump to new institutions arriving with fresh capital, which have never been lacking because, as I've mentioned previously, Nibak is the town where every NGO in Guatemala wants to work. Uh, now, in the 1990s, an Italian-run branch of the UN Development Program created a terrible impression in Nibak by spending millions of dollars on its own creature comforts, doing very, very little for the Ashils. By way of compensation, the UNDP left behind revolving funds that within a few years disappeared into the pockets of administrators and of borrowers who saw no reason to pay up. But this didn't stop the next wave of organizations from setting up more credit programs, all armed with the latest development lingo. By 2008, the loan officers of this new wave of institutions were pointing fingers at each other. They blamed competition among themselves for fostering a culture of non-payment. Several of the loan officers were particularly bitter about the most philanthropic institutions. That is, the, the, the lending agencies with a social mission who do not have to recover capital uh, from their own funders and who therefore will never confiscate property of any kind and who tend to prioritize loans. A particular case put loan officers on notice that many of their loans were not going to be repaid. Last year, a 52-year-old villager, who I will call Doña Esperanza, organized 50 women in her village into four or five solidarity groups. But these were not solidarity groups as set up and regulated by lending institutions. These were groups organized by Doña Esperanza from the bottom up, none of which disclosed their existence to the institutions whom they would ask for loans. Instead, each member of each group approached an institution as an individual and then turned the money over to Doña Esperanza. In return, Esperanza gave each borrower a gift of up to several hundred quetzals. Doña Esperanza said that aside from giving each borrower this cash gift, which would not have to be repaid, she, Doña Esperanza, would take charge of paying back each loan. That same year, Doña Esperanza approached more than a dozen neighbors and asked each of them for loans, too. Again, in one-on-one -on -one solicitations, 
to prevent anyone from grasping the scale of how much money she was borrowing. A few months later, five different institutions in the town of Nebak realized that they had more than 50 female borrowers in a single village who all denied that they had any obligation to repay their loans. Instead, the women all pointed at Doña Esperanza, who on December 17, 2007, loaded all her possessions and chickens onto the early morning bus and left for Guatemala City. Now, when I showed up looking for victims, uh, one of the first doors on which I knocked led to a meeting with six of Doña Esperanza's creditors who had loaned her a total of 122,000 quetzals. Uh, for reference, that's, that would be 10 years of income for a poor household. Just one of her solidarity groups, the 12 women of the group called the Roses, gave her 115,000 quetzals. If these are average totals for the other victims, um, Esperanza managed to borrow close to a million quetzals or uh, something like $135,000 or something like the annual income of 100 poor households. Now, what could she have done with all this money? Doña Esperanza does not speak Spanish. She's never gone to school. She does not know how to read and write. She has no criminal record. Like many of Shields, she belongs to a born-again Protestant church. Her only antecedent, her only criminal antecedent, is that she belonged to one of these solidarity groups, or in this case called a community bank, was set up by a microcredit agency. Um, that's her only apparent preparation for this scam. But when, let's listen to what she had to say. When asking victims for loans, what she said is that uh, uh, she was building a new house and she was supporting a son who was studying to be a lawyer. She told borrowers that they would be repaid with remittances from her husband and from another son who, of course, were in the United States, presumably earning the big money. Now, three months after Doña Esperanza fled, a delegation of victims located her near the capital. They put her under a citizen's arrest, and instead of turning her over to the police, they brought her back to Shield Country. According to Doña Esperanza, it was the fault of her husband in the U.S. who had taught her how to duplicate property deeds so that she could give the same deed to a bunch of people so they'd all think that they had collateral on her house. Doña Esperanza also said it was the, that it was the fault of her son, studying law in Guatemala City, who was the one who had instructed her to organize women into these multiple borrowing groups. According to Doña Esperanza, she'd given her husband and son all the money. The response of her husband and son was to sue her for defamation. Her creditors could not take possession of the handsome new house that she was building because it cleverly had been titled to one of her sons. Nor could her creditors sue the husband and son because the only one who owed them anything was Doña Esperanza. My guess is, this is, situation has still not been clarified, but my guess is that the son studying law figured out how to take advantage of all the weaknesses in the, weaknesses in the legal system so that his mother's debts would be unrecoverable, and he's completely willing to let his mother burn. Um, now, it's interesting that Doña Esperanza is not the only credit sinkhole being peered into by Nebach loan officers. In another notorious case, an illiterate peasant couple with very little Spanish, borrowed several hundred thousand quetzals from relatives and neighbors, again in private one-on-one -on -one deals to disguise the scale of their borrowing. They said they needed the money, of course, to pay off the trip of their daughters to the U.S. This is now why everybody needs money. Um, instead, Doña Elena and her husband gave all the money to a Mayan priest in the city of Quetzaltenango. The Mayan priest promised that in exchange for their offering, they would receive a fortune of millions and millions and millions of quetzals from the sacred volcanoes that ring Quetzaltenango. Where did their relatives and neighbors get all the money that they lent to Doña Elena? By borrowing from their own relatives and neighbors. Um, apparently, many of these de deals were at 10% interest per month. After the money disappeared in Quetzaltenango, creditors started making death threats against borrowers. Uh, Doña Elena's victims went to loan institutions with tall tales about needing the money for other purposes. And so with the bank money, they uh, paid off some of their debts, but now at the cost of huge new loans that were secured with their property titles and which they now have no way to repay. So by the time I showed up, roughly two years after this scam went down, several families 
were being threatened by the loan officers and they were facing the loss of agricultural land and or houses that they'd pledged as collateral. Aside from the headaches over these credit sinkholes, aside from the headaches over the senoras, Nebak loan officers are worried uh, that all the bad news from the U.S., including our recession, including Ishiel's losing job in the construction industry, the, the only Ishiel's making good money were the ones in construction, uh, enforcement of immigration laws, uh, the loan officers are worried that, um, that these trends are cutting off the remittances that many of their clients need to repay their loans. They're also worried that um, since they lack any centralized credit bureau, bureau, an unknown number of their borrowers have taken out additional loans to keep up with an unsustainable first loan. They worry that once a few villagers stop paying their loans, the entire village will stop paying loans, which is actually what has happened on previous occasions. That's what happened in the 1990s. Once a few people stop paying and get away with it, nobody in the village feels that they should have to repay the loan. Um, so um, 2008 is not the first time that Ishiels have had trouble repaying um, credit. During the coffee boom in the early 20th century, outside businessmen used distilled alcohol and Saturday night drinking loans to grab a shield land and send a shield debtors into plantation peonage. Uh, some of the agents in this process were a shields, and so a shields learned to lend money at 10% interest per month. 10% a month is so accepted in Nebach that I, I have yet to find a term for it with the negative connotation of loan sharking. I would assume that 10% a month is predatory, that the lender is taking advantage of the borrower's desperation and is planning on confiscating the collateral. That's what I would assume. And yet 10% has become the customary rate uh, between a shield neighbors. If you're being really generous, you charge 5% a month. And only if you charge 15 or 20% a month would anyone accuse you of being unneighborly. Now, if you've ever read up on the subject of microcredit, you know that microcredit is supposed to undermine loan sharking because obviously the rate of interest is so much lower. And yet in Nebach, for reasons that I have yet to grasp completely, microcredit may have increased loan sharking by multiplying the amount of cash that the shields have to loan to each other. Another boost for loan sharking is that for migrants and their families back home, the most obvious way to multiply a disappointing amount of saving, which is the case for most of them, is to loan whatever you've got, to want to be migrants, either directly or indirectly uh, through a, a money lender that becomes your broker. Given the lack of productive investment opportunities in Nebach, loans to want to be migrants at 10% a month are far and away the most obvious way for anyone to make money quickly. Um, and if you don't have any slate savings at all, the next place uh, to get uh, money is obviously to go to a credit institution with a tall tale about uh, needing the money for something else. Uh, which is why uh, uh, the, the loan officers are afraid that migration to the U.S. is going to become the biggest credit sinkhole of them all, um, not just uh, for the Shields in the U.S. who are struggling to pay back their $5,000 smuggling debt, but for the Shields back home who have been attracted to that 10% a month return and have thrown money into uh, the migration stream. Um, what 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 what? What, what turns up in these situations when you look into them are chains of debt. The chains of debt begin with remittances or they begin with 2% a month uh, uh, loans from credit institutions. The money then gets farmed out in idiosyncratic person-to-person -person deals with probably no bookkeeping, uh, no legal contract, uh, at increasingly higher rates of interest. And of course, the higher the rate of interest, the more likely the deal is to collapse. Another factor that's lengthening debt chains is the impact of all the new sources of cash on the price of real estate in Nebach. The scholarly literature on sending communities in Mesoamerica, there's actually quite a bit of it now, uh, has many terse references to inflation. I've seen very little attention to this problem of inflation, but it turns out that when you pour money into a peasant community like this, you get astronomical inflation for a scarce desired good like land. And in Nibak, it's not just the price of pasture and cropland that has skyrocketed. So is the cost of house lots, building lots, which is a matter of urgent concern since the typical family has five, six, or seven children surviving to adulthood, and only one of them, or two of them at best, is going to be able to inherit the house of their parents. So the Ashils need lots of building lots. And the typical prices for building lots in the center of Nebach reached amazing levels last year. They've now started to sink. 
but building lots often went for twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. I did. I didn't believe that figure when I first heard it, but I've gotten it again and again and again. I I I don't understand how it's possible, but this is what I'm told repeatedly. Even out in a village, uh, not the furthest out villages, but a, a sort of not completely boondock village, a building lot can sell for between five and ten thousand dollars. Good agricultural land has reached the level of six thousand dollars an acre. Um, obviously, only the most successful immigrants uh, to the U.S. have the means to buy land at such prices, uh, and thus real estate inflation has become another factor convincing people that I have to get to the United States. If I don't, I'll never be able to buy a house light or never be able to buy land. Now, uh, one window on inflationary psychology, uh, sort of my last ethnographic note here, is a peasant-invented pyramid scheme called Anikoff. Anikoff is the Spanish acronym for the Association to Support Needy People of One Heart and Faith. It presents itself as an NGO, but it's the only NGO I've ever heard of with an acronym like the Association to Support Needy People of One Heart and Faith. It was started 10 years ago by two Mayan peasants, uh, one from Guatemala, the other from Mexico. They announced that in exchange for a sign-up fee of $60, each individual who joined their association would receive a gift of $100,000, $100,000 per member, provided by wise men in Germany or Canada. For campesinos who are weary of NGO rituals, which include applying for funds, hosting consultants, electing village committees, organizing community workdays, quarreling over expenditures, filing reports, and doing it all again next year, for people who have gotten tired of what it takes to work with NGOs, Anikoff is obviously the aid project of their dreams because it promises to dump piles of cash right in their laps. Tens of thousands of Mayan peasants in Guatemala and Mexico have fallen for this because they've been recruited not just by family members and friends. In some cases, they've been recruited by evangelical pastors and school teachers with high school educations who we would like to think knew better. Members pony up their $60. They attend meeting after meeting. Some of them have prayed for the impending payoff in all-night prayer vigils, and they quietly puzzle over whether they have been cheated or not. In one Mayan town south of Nebak last year, angry victims who realized they'd been cheated burned a gas station belonging to one of the instigators, and they held his accomplices for ransom. The national police had to intervene to get his accomplices back. In Mexico, there's been a very credible, detailed newspaper expose, but Anikoff rolls on. It has even shown up at a conference sponsored by the Organization of American States as a representative of the Mayan people. In Nebak, Anikov has 500 members, particularly in two localities where many people have multiple loans that they don't know how they're going to repay. So thanks to all this, uh, thanks to all the aid, thanks to the credit, thanks to the remittance, uh, my point is that uh, Nebak has become a bubble economy, or more precisely, a dependent inflationary economy. And this is thanks to John Maluccio, who gave me a few pieces of vocabulary I needed here. Uh, Nebak has a dependent economy, um, because even though the main livelihood is peasant farming, it's unable to produce enough food to sustain itself and therefore depends on exporting labor to the outside world. Nebak has an inflationary economy because the inflow of donations, credits, and remittances has led to a price bubble for certain desired assets that are in fixed supply, land being the prime example. So donations, loans, and remittances increase the supply of money. The price of house lots and agricultural land is spiraled beyond reach. And the only way that you think they can afford to buy real estate is by going to the U.S. to work. So underneath this superficial prosperity in Nebak, many local observers sense a lot of desperation. You might think, well, sending youth to the U.S. is the solution to that desperation. But if you look at how remittances and other cash inflows of inflated land prices, you have to think again. Because remittances have the effect of pushing non-recipients of remittances further behind. Even for the migrants, only if you successfully negotiate all the risks of going to the U.S. do you have a chance of buying property. Now, um, you've been listening to me for uh, almost an hour, and you may ask, um, am I suggesting that development programs are hopeless? Uh, actually, no. The shields are better off in some ways, thanks to development programs. 
Am I suggesting that there's something especially rotten about a Mitchfield Maya culture? Uh, no, I'm not suggesting that. Am I suggesting that Ashils are stupid? Well, they can be pretty stupid, but probably no more stupid than Americans. Because if anything, what I want to suggest is that when it comes to easy credit, uh, the Ashil Mayas, these, these beautiful people that you saw up on the screen, actually behave a lot like Americans. When Ashils and Americans are given the chance to borrow lots of money, many of us will do so without necessarily thinking carefully about how we're going to repay it. Some of us think up ingenious schemes. If Shields borrowing at 2% in order to loan at 10%, I think is the same mentality as the American homeowners who took advantage of rising real estate prices to take out increasingly large mortgages on their house. Uh, here in the U.S., easy credit is proving the ruin of a significant fraction of the population, and I think the same thing is going to happen in Nibok. I'll conclude with three implications for the hopes that uh, some of us uh, tie up in the term solidarity. Solidarity is one of those ideals to which it's difficult to object. It's like motherhood, family, community, multiculturalism, diversity, patriotism. Because these ideals are difficult to question, they are easily invoked in order to cover up underlying paradoxes that we would prefer not to think about. All of these words are dangerous because they all have the ability to stop critical thinking or at least slow it down. Think of the problem with solidarity on three levels. The first, obviously, is the solidarity group as envisioned by microcredits. The case of Doña Esperanza suggests that when institutions premise their operations on solidarity, they are using a beautiful word to prettify what to their clients may be a frightening situation of obligation and coercion in which clients can be ruined, if not by the institution, perhaps by unscrupulous fellow borrowers like Doña Esperanza. The second level uh, uh, is the solidarity which uh, many Americans uh, wish to express uh, to poor people. We want to make amends for colonialism, from which we're still benefiting, by showing solidarity with the poor. But poverty in far-off places is not a very easy sell to our fellow Americans, most of whom have other priorities. And so uh, we come to the attention-getting value of earthquake victims, wide-eyed toddlers, and, of course, calendar Mayas like the Ashils, who are easy to commodify because they look great on camera. However well-intentioned these uh, pitches may be, the devil takes his due. In a book called Seeing Like the State, the political anthropologist James Scott has made the point that states must simplify reality in order to make it legible to them. Well, aid organizations also have to simplify reality in order to persuade us to make donations. One of my colleagues has studied aid projects in another town of calendar Mayas, uh, the Todos Santeros of Huehuetenango Department. According to uh, Oscar Barrera Nunez, in towns like Todos Santos and Nebac, there is a, quote, humanitarian economy, unquote, which is generated by a, quote, underlying economy of desires, unquote, in which philanthropists and recipients turn each other into commodities to meet their very different expectations. For example, while we perceive Mayan culture as timeless and harmonious and would like the Ashils to defend their culture, the Ashils are tired of being poor and would like to come work for us here in the United States. The seduction of altruism is how uh, my colleague Oscar terms this mutual misinterpretation, the seduction of altruism. Gringos perceive certain kinds of Guatemalans as ideal beneficiaries, and Guatemalans view gringos as ideal patrons until we disappoint and embitter each other. So that's the second level on which I want to address solidarity. And the third uh, is the level, um, uh, the presumption that uh, poor people have solidarity with each other. In the particular case under review, Ashil women in their traditional dress have aroused so much admiration that many outsiders assume that Ashils have a strong sense of community, which they do on occasion. But day-to-day, -day, Ashil's social life is actually extremely competitive. The most obvious reason for all the elbowing is that the population is doubling every, uh, 20, every, every 30 years. It's also important to remember another reason for this competitiveness is that the Ashils, like many other indigenous people, are campesinos or peasants. Peasants are one of the lowest strata in uh, stratified societies. By definition... The larger economy does not pay them living wages for their labor, which means 
This, which, this is why they have to survive. They have to engage in subsistence farming in order to survive, because they have very little political power. They tend to take out their pent up aggressions on each other. For us as outsiders, it shields look like a victim group, which we can use to set our moral compass. However confusing a country like Guatemala is, and believe me, it is extremely confusing. We're on the side of the Ishiels, and because we're on the side of the Ishiels, we must be on the good side rather than the bad side. But Ishiels cannot, this, and this might work. There are certain situations in which this kind of thinking actually works. If a lot of killing is going on, and you need to locate yourself morally pretty quickly and take a position, putting, siding with pretty pictures of peasants and providing money to the right organization, that actually is an adequate response. I'm not telling you not to do that. So that'll work under certain circumstances. But even if that's a useful move on our part to view the Ishiels as a victim group, Ishiels cannot view each other as a victim group. They have to deal with each other as individuals who are competing for scarce land, scarce contacts with wealthy foreigners, and scarce opportunities for getting ahead. Some Ishiel men go to the U.S., work like donkeys, and send home every spare dollar. Other Ishiels go to the U.S. and start new families abandoning their wives and children back home. This is why Ishiels cannot view each other as a victim group. Some Ishiels are saints, others are complete jerks, and too many in between have been lending money to each other at 10% a month. So the question becomes, with precisely which Ishiels do you or I, do we want to be in solidarity? If you want to be in solidarity with those wives and mothers, with the Ishiel women, um, the ones who are frantic now with worry over their debts, you may not be in solidarity with those husbands and sons who literally bet the family farm in order to come to the U.S. More generally, I don't think anybody should premise third world aid projects on the assumption that third world people have solidarity with each other because they photograph nicely. There are certain situations in which Ashields have solidarity with each other, just like there are certain situations in which Americans have solidarity with each other. There are many other situations in which Americans and the Shields do not have solidarity with each other. And we should not be premising projects for poor people on the assumption that they are somehow more selfless or communal or virtuous than we are, because the truth of the matter is, I don't think they are. So I've been talking too long, and thank you for being very patient with me.